Hello, I'm Tim Shoebridge. The subject of today's video is the Expressive E Osmos and how to control it. How to control it from your door or from any other sequencer, whether it's a hardware sequencer or a software sequencer. Um, that's what's coming up in this video. Now, the first question, I guess, is, well, why would you want to control this uh, from a sequencer or from your door? It is a controller of its own. So why am I wanting to control the controller? Um, it's a very good question, uh, and of course, playing this instrument, it's all about the expression that you can get with the keys and your fingers down and, and playing it, right? So why would you just want to just like throw a sequence at it? Well, there are going to be times when you want to do that, or certainly there are when I want to do that, um, and I guess there are two scenarios that I want to talk about really, just before we get into the details of how to control the Osmos using MIDI. Um, I'm just going to play you now uh, just a little snippet of a track that I put together for my last video about the Osmos. Um, and at the time that I did that track, I, I hadn't figured out how to uh, successfully record MIDI data from the Osmos to my door and then be able to play it back again. So everything that you're hearing in that track, I've kind of played it live, I just recorded the audio. Uh, I might as well have been playing, I don't know, an acoustic piano or a, or a real vintage synth that doesn't have MIDI in out or CV and gate in out. And, and that's something that I'm not particularly comfortable with and I don't like doing. And the reason I don't like doing that is because I'm not a very good player and I, I generally don't play in time. And when I listen to that track, uh, there's a few cringy moments in there where I can just hear I've just not, I've just not played the, the, the notes on time or what I, what I consider to be on time to be. Um, and so what I would really like to do is to be able to treat the Osmos like any other keyboard synthesizer that I have and, and I will always, if I can possibly do it, I will record not only the audio of what I'm playing to my door but I'll also record the MIDI as well and so by recording the MIDI it allows me to make some adjustments, quantize some notes if I want to do that, play around with velocity maybe, just get it sounding exactly the way I want to and then obviously I would then need to play that MIDI back out to my keyboard, my synth and, and re-record the audio. But that also allows me to do other stuff like you know play around with the synthesizer parameters, get the sound exactly the way I want to, and try out some different presets. It's, it's kind of the luxury of what a door is all about, that it allows you to do that, not only recording audio, but also MIDI. And it's something that I really do rely on. And it's something that I want to be able to do with the Osmos. Um, so as I said at the beginning, uh, I, I, I hadn't figured out at that point in time how to get the Osmos to talk to my door and my door to talk to my Osmos successfully. Um, but I figured all that out now. I've had some great help from the guys at Expressive E uh, to help me along that path. So that's what I'm going to share with you today, how to do it. And we're going to actually sort of like investigate the Osmos together. We're going to see what MIDI data it spews out and how it kind of works and how its expression works. Uh, because that's the real key to being able to control it uh, via a door or a sequencer. So how we're going to get started is, is a simple experiment. I'm just going to create a very, very simple sequence in my door and, and then try and control the Osmos and let's see what happens. Right, so let's have a little experiment. Let's just send a sequence of MIDI notes to the Osmos and see what happens. So I'm doing this in my door. Um, I'm using Cubase. You'll see here that I've set up a very, very simple little sequence with four notes in it. Um, and this is what it looks like in Cubase. Just four notes. So note on, note off, note on, note off, note on, note off, note on, note off. That's all. No controller data, nothing clever going on here. Just four notes. Um, so this is just going to be very, very similar to using any sequencer and sending 
note data to the Osmos. It could be a hardware sequencer or a software sequencer. It doesn't matter. So just these four notes. Now, where do we send it to? So the thing is, once you hook up your Osmos to your computer for the very first time using a USB cable, you'll notice that there are actually two MIDI devices that appear on your computer. There are two class compliant MIDI devices. Let me show you in the little drop down list here in Cubase. Um, we have got one called Osmos, which is fair enough, um, but we've also got one called um, well, it's, it's MIDI 2. There's a MIDI Out 2 and there's a MIDI In 2 uh, with Osmos in brackets at the end. Now, why are there these two MIDI devices with the Osmos? I'm not sure exactly what they're used for, but what I do know is that uh, if you use your Osmos as an external MIDI controller keyboard to control other uh, MPE compliant uh, synthesizers, um, then you're going to use the Osmos MIDI device for that. However, if you're going to use the, uh, the synth engine inside the Osmos um, and you're going to hook it up to the Huck and Audio software editor, the Egan Matrix software editor, to control the synth engine, then it is this uh, second device here, this MIDI in and out too that you need for that. So there are these two different roles with these different MIDI devices. So which of these MIDI devices should we send our note data to in order to play the synth? Uh, well, we'll try both of them. Let's try this Osmos uh, device first of all. Um, I'm just going to play these four notes. Let's see what happens. Absolutely nothing. Uh, so we don't get any sound at all. Uh, using the Osmos MIDI device. Let's try the MIDI out to brackets Osmos instead. Let's have a go at that one. It works. Well, it appears to work until you actually play that patch on the keyboard itself, and this is what it really sounds like. As opposed to so we do know that the Osmos is an MPE compliant uh, keyboard controller keyboard with an MPE compliant sound engine synth engine inside it um, and if you, you know, if you check out uh, MPE you'll realize that it's a quite a lot more complicated to just than just simply defining some notes and sending them um, it's actually a multi-channel uh, protocol MPE. In order to get expression on one note only, separate from the other notes, and any MPE controller has to allocate a unique MIDI channel to each note. Um, and that kind of limits the polyphony of MPE. But it's a multi-channel um, kind of protocol. And, and what we're doing here is just sending a, a bunch of notes just to one channel. At the moment, I've, I've, it's defaulting to channel number one. Well, let's try uh, channel number two, see if that makes any difference. It's silent now. Um, and in fact, if I was to go through all of these channels, the only channel that doesn't make any noise is channel number one, and it's not the right noise. So let's figure out what the Osmos is doing with MIDI. Let's record it into our door as an experiment and see what MIDI data we get, because that will give us a clue as to how to send MIDI data back to the Osmos and get it to make proper sounds. Right, so for this second experiment, what we're going to do is just play some notes on the Osmos and record them in my door, and just let's see what kind of MIDI data we end up recording. In fact, I'm just going to play one note, not many notes, just one note. I'm going to hold down a note slowly. I'm then going to go full poly after touch depression with it, lift it up to the midpoint again. I'm going to wiggle it around, do some vibrato, and then take my finger off. So we'll see, hopefully, how all of those movements are represented in MIDI data. So if we take a quick look at my door here, I've got my MIDI track 
my one single MIDI track here. I'm listening to the, the MIDI 2 device. So that was the one that actually played some notes last time. I'm listening to it. It's called MIDI In 2 here, whereas before it was MIDI Out 2. So MIDI In 2, that's what we're listening to. Um, let's just press record and play. So just one note, hold it down very, very slowly. Can feel it's down to its sort of on position. I'm going to press harder now. So this is poly after touch. All the way down the bottom, back up again. Now let's wiggle it side to side. And off. Right, let's see what we recorded. So if you look here in Cubase, now if you're not familiar with Cubase, the way that Cubase represents notes, as in note on, note offs, the kind of traditional way of recording notes in, in a door using MIDI, uh, that's what this long horizontal line, solid line is for. These other lines, if I zoom in, you'll see they're much finer, these much finer lines, these are representing MIDI event data. Uh, MIDI CCs basically, they could be mod wheel, they could be pitch bend, they could be anything. Um, so as you can see, as well as that note on, note off, there's all of this other data that's been recorded here. An awful lot of data at the beginning as I was pressing down on the key, a lot of data at the end as I'm letting go of it. This section here I think is where I was doing the vibrato, the side to side wobble. And this stuff in the middle here is, I believe, the poly aftertouch. So let's figure out what this stuff actually is here. And the way to do that in Cubase, just double click on it, and it opens up in an editor. Now, I think this is fairly similar across different doors. We've got this piano roll editor here. I'm just zooming in, zooming out. Let's just get it in the middle there. So there's our note that we played, C2. And this down here, this is showing the velocity that I played that note with. Now, I pressed down that note very, very gently. Uh, I didn't whack on the keyboard at all, yet the velocity is recorded as 127, and 127 is maximum velocity. So that's a bit odd, isn't it? Because it was a very gradual onset of the note, very, very soft, uh, and yet we've got maximum velocity. So it doesn't look right. Let's look at these different uh, MIDI events here. And I've done this before, so I know what I'm looking for. Uh, I'm going to go and look at Aftertouch. Now, Aftertouch here, you'll see we've got this gradual onset of Aftertouch uh, until I get to the top. Uh, and then it's constant at the top, maximum Aftertouch until I let go. And it's Aftertouch. Now, this is channel pressure. This is the MIDI um, a message for channel pressure, which is mono after touch. It's after touch, which is being used to capture how fast or slowly I press down on the note until it's fully on, and how fast or slow I let go of the note. It's using after touch. Um, but it's not using the after touch message to record what I did afterwards, which was Pressing down, which is poly after touch, that is a different uh, control message altogether, and it's actually MIDI CC74. When we look at MIDI CC74, you'll see there is the point where I did the sort of full down poly after touch, pressed down on the key, all the way up to maximum, held it for a little while, and then let go of it back again. Now here, this bit is where I was wobbling around doing the vibrato, and I was just pressing down on the note a little bit. So I was giving it a little bit of aftertouch, poly aftertouch, while I was doing that, you know, that vibrato stage. But that is my poly aftertouch, that's my pressure down, um, and it's MIDI CC74. The last thing I want to show you is pitch bend itself. Uh, and you'll see here, that's where all of my vibrato is going on. That's where all my pitch bend wobble is going on. Now, I don't know if, uh, if, if you're a Cubase expert out there and can help me out, because I've been using Cubase for a very long time, and I don't know how to magnify or zoom in on this uh, view 
of this data uh, sort of vertically. I know how to do it up here. We can use this little slider here to zoom in and out. Uh, and I can also use a keyboard shortcut to do the same thing, but I have no idea how to do it down here. So unfortunately, I can't really show you this very well. I can show you all of the individual sort of data points where pitch bend was being sent, um, and I can hover over them. It's plus 18 there, four, minus two, minus nine. So you can see there's a little variation as I was bending the key backwards and forwards. That's my pitch bend down there. So basically, to provide expression, what the Osmos is doing is it's using uh, channel pressure or mono after touch messages uh, to correspond with the amount that I'm pressing down or up. And once I am down, it's using MIDI CC 74 to, uh, to, to to record how much I'm pressing down with what I would call poly after touch. That bit. And then in terms of side to side vibrato wobble, that is using pitch bend. Those are our three dimensions, if you like, of expression. And that's how they're recorded. And so as you can tell, you know, when we go back to our first experiment of just simply just doing note on, note off and sending it to the Osmos, it's clear as to why we didn't get the sound that we wanted to, because we're not providing all of this other information. Um, and it's just, a, it's just a fact of life that the Osmos, or should I say the Huckin synth engine inside the Osmos, is, is kind of ignoring velocity altogether. It doesn't need it because it's got this, how quickly or slowly I go through that pressure stage. That is what is really driving how loud the sound is or the sort of like amplitude amplitude envelope. Now I have to say though that it's it's all about the presets as to how they want to handle this event data, the pressure data, the, the poly aftertouch data, and the, the side to side data. It's up to the presets. So, you know, one preset might behave uh, with a, a gradual onset of, of the volume of the patch, uh, whereas another one might not at all. It might just come instantly on. It all depends on how the preset's been programmed. But those are the three dimensions of expression. So that's an awful lot of MIDI data that gets sent out of the Osmos uh, and you can capture it in your door and you can play it back. I didn't show you that, but you can. You can just play it back and it will work and it'll sound authentic and, and everything. Um, and, and this isn't an Osmos specific thing here, all this data. This is MPE. This is what it's about. This is capturing all of that event data across multiple channels. Uh, it is MPE. Any MPE controller, keyboard or other controller is going to generate all of that data and all that data then gets consumed and understood by an MPE enabled synthesizer. So um, where does that leave me really with, with doors and sequences and sequencing uh, the Osmos? Well, it's it depends on your requirement here. Now, I've got a very, very specific requirement that is that I can capture my performance, play around with the notes, get the quantizing right, uh, play around with velocities, get those right, um, and just get my performance the way I would like it to be, but I am not able to play it. Um, and, and that's my specific requirement. And, you know, you can say, well, tough shit. You know, if you were playing a cello or, or an acoustic piano, you'd just be recording the audio and that's it. You just got to learn how to play properly. <laughs> um, but we do have the MIDI data here, so why can't I? Well, I can, of course. I can I can move note on uh, sort of events around and time quantize them basically, and then I can you know I can identify hopefully the the correct. Uh, pressure messages and, and shuffle those backwards and forwards as well. But imagine how complicated it will look in, in a door if you're playing multiple uh, keys at the same time. You've got multiple pressure you know, messages all firing off on different channels. It gets very, very complicated. Um, and really, I guess what I'm, what I'm basically saying is that, that, that Cubase as it stands is, is not really going to help me edit MPE data. Uh, I'd like a different view, a way of kind of encapsulating all of that data into a note and all its events and being able to move things around. I guess that's what I really would like. 
Um, but there are some things that you can do. Um, and I'm going to show you a little solution that I've come up with uh, to help me um, with the simple stuff. I mean, I know if I'm playing some kind or trying to play some kind of virtuoso, you know, um, uh, solo going on here with lots of expression, then you know what? I'm going to have to just get it right. And if I want to tweak it, then it's going to be a lot of hard work to do so. Uh, but there are there's a lot of music that I want to create with the Osmos because the sound engine inside it really does sound amazing. Even with just simple little stabs and little sequences and little arpeggios going on, it does sound really, really nice. Um, and so I'd, I'm trying to look for a sort of a shortcut way of being able to use a door in a kind of traditional way with just notes, but actually control the Osmos and the sound engine inside and, and get some of that, of that realism that's there. And that's what I'm going to show you next. Right, so I'm back in my door here. I've just put in a little sequence as you can see here on the screen, just simple notes. I just drew them in. There's no event data going on here. It's just literally note on, note off MIDI data. Uh, it happens to be my door, but it could be a hardware sequencer. Um, and I'm just going to press play. There you go. So that door sequence is controlling the Osmos and it's got a little, well, a very, very nice preset called Flute Transverse and it sounds like this. And I'm playing it from the door. So, Let's see what's going on here. Now, this is not a MIDI track. Um, it's got MIDI data in it, but it's not a MIDI track. It's an instrument track. And the instrument, the VST plugin that I'm running is a voltage modular. Um, and if I show you what is running here in voltage modular, there you can see I've created a little module. Um, I came up with a silly name for it. ESO EMSO, uh, if you look at that, you can see that it's just Osmos backwards because that's kind of what we're doing. You know, the Osmos is a, an MPE controller for controlling other synthesizers, um, and here we are controlling the controller. So we're kind of using the Osmos in reverse. So I, I thought it'd be really funny to reverse the name Osmos and come up with my own. So ESO EMSO. But anyway, um, I'm still working on this software. It's not, it's not ready for public. Um, public usage yet. Uh, I'm still trying to play around with it and get it to work uh, the best way I possibly can. But basically what this module is doing is it's accepting MIDI data in and it is throwing MIDI data out. Now the MIDI data that goes into it is the MIDI data here from Nine Door. It's just simple single channel note on note off data. That's all it is. And that's what it'll accept. And then what it then spews out the other end, which it sends to the Osmos, is rather more complicated, multi-channel, event-filled data, uh, data that the Osmos can understand. Uh, let me show you it um, hooked up to my keyboard here, so I'll just play it from a regular controller keyboard and I'll explain a little bit how it works. All right, so what is ESO EMSO? Well, as I, as I sort of like described very, very briefly, it is just a little module that I've written little software module. It happens to run inside Voltage Modular, which is a wonderful sort of virtual uh, Eurorack modular environment. If you don't know about uh, Voltage Modular, then definitely check out Cherry Audio's website and take a look at it. It's really, really loads of fun. It's very, very cool. I've released quite a few modules over the last couple of years uh, that mainly do MIDI kind of operations. And so this is very, very similar in that respect. Um, as I described before, it's basically taking in normal, regular, non-MPE compliant MIDI, note on, note off, can be from a, a door, from a hardware controller that you happen to map into your computer, um, uh, from a keyboard controller like the one I'm going to play here, from a hardware sequencer. Uh, as long as you can get that MIDI into your computer 
um, and therefore route it into voltage modular then uh, my module can then process it so basically what my module is doing is it's waiting and listening for MIDI on and MIDI off so for notes um, and and then what it's doing is it is doing the MPE thing it is a sort of like allocating a, a unique channel to each note that gets held down and remembering which note belongs to which channel which is why you can see here kind of little voices section there are a set number of voices with my module here I've got 12 voices of polyphony so as I hold down some notes you'll see that the voices are getting used up so it's doing all of that multi-channel cleverness um, and allocating notes to channels. Um, and so it's sending those note, on, note offs to the Osmos on unique channels, which is what it needs to do. But then in terms of being able to play any sounds and play them properly, it's having to emulate that pressing down of a note and letting go of a note, which is that kind of that pressure, well, it's actually uh, channel pressure mono after touch messages so that's what my software is doing is it's generating those pressure messages on and off and the way i decided to try and do that was to use an envelope generator inside my module which is this middle section here um, and you can see that i've got quite a sharp attack uh, and quite a sharp decay you can change these here with these controls um, and this blue line across the top here is showing because I've got sustain turned on. I could turn sustain off uh, and then it would just be attack decay straight away. So this is a very long attack and decay. No sustain. Sounds like this. And you hear you're getting all of that lovely expression that the preset is giving you, that kind of breath sound at the beginning as you get the onset of the attack. Let's put sustain back on again. And then when I let go, what it's going to do is it's going to play out that pressure slope, the decay part of the envelope generator. And then at the very end, when it gets down to zero, it's then going to send a note off to the Osmos. So you'll see here all those voice uh, LEDs are on at the moment. I let go, they stay on until the envelope has finished its completion. So that's the way of m me simulating no on, no off. Uh, you can, if we go back to the defaults, you do quite hard on off or much slower. like that. Um, now, by developing this software, what I've come to really appreciate is how incredibly amazing the Osmos keyboard is as an MPE controller keyboard. The, the level of expression that's there is just incredible, and it's due to the, the, the high frequency with which um, event data is being sent to the synth engine by the keyboard. It's uh, something like 500 hertz, 500 times a second messages are being sent from each key to the synth engine, which means there's incredible expression here. Just the slightest movement gets you these wonderful little nuances in, in, in expression. Um, and I've only really appreciated it trying to emulate it, trying to emulate it with a simple little envelope that's just got a sort of a linear attack and a linear decay isn't really doing this synth justice at all. So what I'm doing here is not what I would, you know, suggest that you do. I would suggest that you play your Osmos because it sounds absolutely wonderful. It feels wonderful too. But in those situations where you want to control the Osmos from a door, from a sequencer, or just play it from some other keyboard for whatever reason you want to do so, then this software kind of is a very rough and ready emulation of what you can do with the keyboard itself. So we've got this um, envelope generator here. Uh, if we're not doing sustain, then we have actually got a hold portion, so you can sort of hold the envelope open for a while. Like that. Um, and I've also added a little delay as well at the beginning, so you can delay the onset of the envelope as well. 
Um, other things that we've got going on here are, well, in terms of the amount of pressure, it's always maximum. It'll eventually get to maximum. And that's very samey, and it doesn't, you know, there's not a lot of expression going on there with that. So I've added a slop capability. So this is just going to add some random variance to not only the sort of like the maximum pressure that gets sent, but also to the the attack and the decay portions of the envelope. Um, and we've got other ways of varying the height, or the amount of pressure that gets sent. Uh, we've got keyboard tracking, so at maximum tracking. Uh, the, the the pressure will be highest with high notes and lowest with low notes. Uh, so if I've got it on maximum, and you can hardly hear the, the, the low note I'm playing at the moment. So you've got keyboard tracking if you want to vary it uh, with, with pitch. And we've got velocity as well. So if I take the sort of like the velocity right down to zero, then it's going to be at maximum all the time. And that's loud. That's what maximum is. Um, but I can add velocity here so that the harder I hit my keys, because obviously it gets maximum velocity no matter what the Osmos does. But in terms of the MIDI that's coming into my module, the harder I hit my keys or play the notes in a sequencer, then the higher the pressure will be. The softer I play the keys, the lower the pressure will be. So that gives you a little bit of sort of like expression to what you're playing. If I whack it up to maximum, you get the better effect. So we've got a velocity in there as well. The last thing to really mention about this envelope here is this last control after touch in red. So, you know, the when you're playing the Osmos, you're playing the keys, it's kind of a, you know, it's just a, a gradual but constant transition from pressure on to actually poly after touch. It's all one smooth, beautiful movement. You can sort of like just keep on going deeper and deeper with the keys as far as you want to go. So the you know the the expression ends up being pressure getting bigger and bigger and bigger and then you get to the point where the keys are now on and then you get gradual uh, after touch poly after touch pressure after that so what i decided to do with uh, my envelope generator here is for you to be able to adjust at what point after touch pressure kicks in so if i have a long attack like this so at this part this is all pressure and then here this is when the note is fully on, and now we start to get poly after touch above it. So you've got this ability to be able to determine when after touch kicks in. Let's just find out what the sound sounds like when after touch is actually being played. You get a harmonics, like a one octave up. So if I play this uh, as it stands here with just a few notes and I introduce after touch, you'll hear the effect of it. So you can hear the effect of after touch being introduced by this same envelope. So the envelope at this point here, half of that attack is going to be pressure and then the poly after touch takes over afterwards. So that's another way of varying the sound and introducing some of the after touch because depending on the preset on the Osmos, the after touch can be very, very subtle uh, or be very, very drastic. So it's nice to have that control over poly after touch versus pressure in terms of the onset and the release of it. And as I've been playing around with the keyboard um, and, and sort of like really actually enjoying playing the sounds on the Osmos, but from a regular keyboard, one thing I started to do subconsciously was try and wiggle the keys because I wanted a bit of vibrato. And of course you can't do that because you really need to be playing the Osmos itself. So I decided to add a bit of vibrato here. So this is a very, very simple triangle LFO. Um, you can delay the onset of it. You can set the depth and the speed of it, and it's only going to be triggered if you are sustaining 
uh, notes. So after, when the sustain portion kicks in, that's when the vibrato will kick in. So uh, let's have a go at that. No vibrato. Let's turn up the depth a bit. Let's delay it a little bit, maybe. Let's get rid of the after touch. I still need to play around with it a little bit more and get the sort of like onset of it to sort of like a bit more gradually come in. But it is vibrato that is being generated by MIDI messages. And uh, you know, MIDI messages, when, you, when you're running software on a computer that's not really meant for you know, being a MIDI controller, uh, MIDI is not, you know, with all of the experience I've got now of, of sort of developing software that controls and generates MIDI messages, what I realize is that home computers are pretty rubbish when it comes to you know precise MIDI message timing. They really are rubbish. You know, MIDI was designed originally for dedicated hardware. Um, and, and when we're doing it in software, the, the timing is all over the place. So don't expect the vibrato to be beautiful like a, you know, like a, an LFO should be. It's, it's, it's MIDI messages being sent to the Osmos to give you that pitch bend. Um, and so it's going to be a little bit rough and ready, but I'm going to sort of like play around a little bit more with the algorithm and get it to be a little bit smoother. So that's vibrato. I added that in as well. And then this last section here over on the right hand side was just something I've added very, very recently um, because I reached for the mod wheel and turned the mod wheel up and nothing happened. And so I thought that the Osmos had a regular mod wheel. Um, it's got it's got a, a control in place of a mod wheel. But what this control does is, and it all depends on the preset, how it's been programmed, but this, this control here will control one of the six macros. So every preset has got these six macros for changing the sound in some way. Um, and this control can be used to change one of those macros. Uh, rather than reaching for a, for a knob, and and it's down to the preset as to which macro it is that you want to change. So with this flute sound, what is it doing? It's adding a flutter in vibrato. It's called as a macro, and it's the second macro, macro number two. So if I want to emulate that from a door or a hardware sequencer or a hardware controller uh, using a mod wheel or using the CC for a mod wheel, um, then what I can do is say, okay, I want it to control macro number two. And so now I get that flutter. But what I can do, uh, which is something that the Osmos can't do, is I could just say, oh, I don't want to do that. Let's just change number three, whatever number three is. Number three is tone. And let's face it, I could actually change them all at the same time if I wanted to do by clicking them all like that. So just with the mod wheel, it's the same as me going in and changing all, you know, turning up all of those knobs, which you can't do because there's only four of them here, uh, but turning them all up at the same time, all six of those macros. So that's another thing I've added. So that's basically it. That's what my little uh, sort of like software does. Um, and I'm finding it actually very, very useful. And I'm also finding that um, it's great for for discovering new sounds. So you can sort of like choose a preset that's a real plucky kind of sound, but then by adding a long attack and decay, uh, you can you can change its sort of like tonal properties completely and be playing, you know, completely different sounds. Let's just have a quick go at that. So this is one of the plucks, it's called Harmolick, I really like it. Um, and let's see what it sounds like when we play it on a regular uh, keyboard. And uh, let's just make sure this is all back to where it should be. Okay, 
So uh, let's just play it like this. Now, when I've done my previous videos, you'll notice that I talked about something called pressure glide, and it's really, really cool, and it's a way of gliding from one note to the next, or across multiple notes, uh, by holding down multiple notes at the same time, you get this wonderful glide effect, and it's turned on or off and configured on a preset by preset basis. Now, this particular preset, Harmonic, has got it set, so I can do this. Like that. Um, now, sending just regular note data to it, uh, but not able to do that, you still get a bend effect. So you still get that kind of expressive capability um, of that particular, you know, that, that, that pressure glide feature. Uh, by using this software. It's not quite the same, but you do get that kind of effect. If we muck about a bit with the attacks, let's have a really, really hard attack. So with a really percussive preset like this one, it's best to have a very, very, very hard attack. I see I'm wanting to wobble, but I can't. Uh, or we could completely change it by adding a long attack, a long decay. Let's get rid of the sustain portion and try that. I forgot to mention, I also added a little loop capability here to the envelope, so it'll loop whatever you've got here. So that's it, that's my software so far. It's not ready for public uh, consumption yet. I'm still playing around with it. I'm still trying to get it to be as accurate as possible. Um, and really the challenge for me is to be able to generate enough uh, MIDI messages, you know, a frequency of MIDI messages that really does the, uh, the Huck and Audio synth engine uh, justice and I really need to be sort of like I'm on the edge really of of how much MIDI data I can send from a piece of software here that's written in Java how much uh, how many you know MIDI note of MIDI messages per second that I can send into the Osmos to get some really you know sort of like realistic sounding expression um, but I'll, I'll release it as soon as I think that it's ready and good enough um, but that's it it's just a little utility for being able to control the Osmos remotely from a door from a software sequencer hardware sequencer hardware controller anything that generates MIDI that you can then route into your computer through my software and back out to the Osmos. You know, it's not what the Osmos was designed for by any means at all. It's a really wonderful and unique expressive uh, keyboard. Um, but for those, you know, those occasions when you actually just want to do something simple, but you want to get at those wonderful, wonderful presets and sounds that it's capable of generating, then this is an option. Thanks very much. Until the next one, see you then. Thank you.